Okay, so let's take a little closer look at at least three of the fronts, a warm front, then a cold front, then an occluded front. Remember that um, a warm front, the warm air is the aggressor. The warm air, the warm air mass is moving in onto a cold air mass. And one of the things to make sense of these, um, of these transition zones, these, these air masses meeting, what happens at these fronts, is keep in mind that the cold air is dense. Cold air is dense. And so it will kind of hug the ground because it's so dense. And so we get, um, let's see, here's, here's our figure here. There was warm, stable air moving in, moving this way, a warm air mass. And the cold air here is dense. And since it's dense, even though this warm air is moving in this figure from left to right, and it will eventually, this is what we call the transition zone right here. I don't know if you can kind of see the, the red line with the semicircles there. That's our specifically our warm front. But um, notice that this uh, warm air will, for a certain amount anyway, kind of what we say overrun. Okay, this is called overrunning, where this warm air will go up and over the cold, dense air. Okay. Um, remember we talked about lifting mechanisms and we said that um, frontal lifting is a way to get chunks of air to rise. And so if we have this stubborn, dense, cold air mass here and this warm air on the move, and it will be lifted up um, over this cold air, and as it's lifted up, remember we talked about the, the chunk of air will expand. As it expands, it will cool. And it cools, we will eventually get um, condensation. And at some point, if there's enough uh, water moisture, we'll get precipitation. So what happens is we end up with kind of a series of clouds. OK, let me go ahead and draw my stick man over here. Here's my stick man or stick woman, and we have this warm front headed this way. So notice, as with regard to cloud cover, what that stick man is first going to see is the type of cloud we've called cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds are those ones that look like mare's tails. They're the highest and they're wispy. They're kind of a stratus type of cloud. Then as that front, the warm front gets closer, that stick figure will see cirrostratus clouds, a little bit lower, still sort of a a layered cloud, followed by alto stratus, that's that middle flat cloud, and then ultimately a precipitating cloud, nimbo stratus. So this is kind of the series of clouds that uh, you would expect to see with an oncoming warm front. And actually there are some like uh, wives' tail, or not wives' tails, but kind of um, some kind of little weather proverbs that kind of talk about that series of clouds coming through. So one of the thing about a warm front is, I don't know if you noticed before on the previous slide, but it is very sloped because of, and, and it's what we call overrunning, remember, where this is our cool air and this is our warm air mass. Okay, we call this overrunning, and sometimes it's called upsloping, um, seems like I've heard it said before, and where this right here is our front in itself. So the transition zone is pretty darn, um, there's, a, there's a fair bit of slope to it. Um, this does show where sometimes we can, uh, our, our lifting that goes on as the warm air, the warm air mass um, is being lifted up by the cooler air, sometimes it can bring um, it can be so unstable that we do get uh, thunderstorms, but I wouldn't think near as much as with a cold front. In general, if you have precipitation from those usually nimbostratus clouds we saw on the previous slide, that sort of precipitation is going to um, be kind of light to moderate and it's going to last for a long time. If we compare now precipitation and other things of a warm front with a cold front now. So with a cold front, 
our cold air is the aggressor. And I don't know if you can see already right away, but the, our transition zone is more abrupt. Instead of being nice and sloped, it is very kind of, um, it's kind of vertical, kind of straight up and down. So in this scenario, with a cold front, we have cold air is the aggressor and it's moving into warm air. Now remember we said that cold air or cool air is dense dense relative to being warm or hot anyway, okay? So basically, it kind of acts as a steam shovel. It kind of hugs the ground and says, eh, you know, I'm going to overtake you, warm air mass. And then that, that air associated with the warm mass, air mass over here, just like a steam shovel, it's basically lifted up kind of abruptly. And so it's that abrupt lifting that if it's uh, moist, if it's warm, moist air, then um, we can go ahead and definitely have condensation and precipitation and severe weather. Okay, so the transition zone is steeper. Now, one of the things, and when we talk about occluded fronts, keep this in mind, that a cold air mass in general will... Uh, move faster than a warm air mass. Uh, frontal lifting is more abrupt. Um, notice that, remember the type of cloud that we associated with severe weather is a uh, cumulonimbus cloud, shown here. Now when a precipitation does occur, thunderstorms, um, in general they will be more short-lived and more intense. Uh, bouts of precipitation than associated with a warm front. All right. So a stationary front. Oh, I do have a slide in here. Stationary front, I don't have a whole lot to say, but remember in a stationary front we have alternating semicircles and triangles, so it would probably look like this. And these segments would be colored appropriately the triangles would be blue and the semicircles, of course, would be red. That's a stationary um, front. And so in this case, we have, what, cold air up here. I can tell by the direction of the triangles. And we have warm air down here. So we have two warm air masses, and it's kind of a standoff. Now, stationary fronts, if you keep an eye on them, eventually will kind of cut loose. And oftentimes, and we'll see this with mid-latitude cyclones, that as, mid, as a mid-latitude cyclone matures, these stationary fronts kind of break loose and we have a segment that turns into a cold front and a segment on the war, on a, uh, turns into a warm front. Okay, so stationary fronts. Notice that we can get, like the slide said, over, overrunning, um, especially on the cold air mass side. And so stationary fronts, sometimes you will see, um, let me see, overrunning over here. So sometimes you'll see your radar, with radars pick up precipitation, sometimes you'll see some sort of precipitation over there. Um, identifying uh, a stationary front can be kind of tricky, and this kind of goes back to meteorologists kind of have, uh, as I understand it, kind of their own sense about where to draw these front lines in the first place. So the last one I want to talk about is the occluded front. And um, as we talk about, I already mentioned that occluded fronts basically have three air masses are involved. And one of the things in order to kind of understand a, an occluded front is that the cold air will travel more quickly. Cold air or cool air travels more quickly. So um, when we talk about occlusion, what's happening is a middle air mass, usually a warm, a type of warm air mass, a middle air mass is lifted by a cold air mass that is catching up with a third air mass in front of it. I'll kind of show this to you. Okay, now I went ahead and moved uh, the next three slides. If you printed out the PowerPoint slides, you might want to circle the next three slides because I bumped them later and hopefully you'll kind of agree with where I put them. So occluded fronts. There are at least a couple types of occluded fronts. Okay, they both involve multiple air masses. 
But now, can you kind of see the three air masses here? Let's talk about what they are. Oops, let me do that. This is looking kind of edge on. Of course, here's the Earth's surface. So you are looking edge on at an occluded front. And your occluded front would be right here. Kind of draw a line on either side. Okay, so what happens? What are our three air masses? We have cold air there. We have cool air there, so it's not moving quite as fast, is it? And then the sector of air kind of between them is warm air. So notice that there's the three air masses, and I'm kind of showing you how this cold air caught up with the chunk of air in front of it, which basically caught up with the chunk of air that was in front of the warm air. Okay, so that's one type of occluded front. Um, now we do have a warm type of occluded front, and let's take a look at it right quick. Look at the difference. We have cool air that's catching up ultimately with colder air, and again lifting a segment, a sector of air, a third air mass aloft. So I don't necessarily get differentiate between the different types of occluded fronts, but um, Hopefully you would recognize that occluded front has three air masses. One other front I want to throw in here um, is something called a dry line. Now, in a dry line, actually, we have two warm air masses that are clashing. Remember when we talked about our five different types of air masses, we said T stands for tropical. So these are two warm air masses that are clashing. But what the difference is, is one is continental, so it will be dry, and the other is maritime, so it will be moist or humid or wet, however you want to think of it. So, and this is significant. Our storm chasers actually are familiar with dry lines. And in our southwest um, uh, United States in the summertime and in the spring, our storm chasers will look for these dry lines, clashes between continental tropical, which only form in the summertime, and maritime tropical air matching, running into each other. So what happens is the dry air, remember dry air is more dense. I know it it seems like humid air or wet air, air with a lot of moisture is dense, but actually it's lighter. So that dry air will lift the warm, moist air upward. That's the frontal lifting that occurs. And if you get warm, moist air going up, bada boom, you have a very unstable situation. So here's just kind of a, a showing you the passage of a of this type of front, this what we call a dry line front. And you can tell that a dry line has passed if your dew point temperatures, use your dew point temperatures to kind of gauge your humidity. So for instance, um, if we compare this, okay, here is a dew point temperature of 62 degrees Fahrenheit with after the passage of the dry line, it's uh, down to 46, um, that you have to go clear down to 46 degrees Fahrenheit as a dew point temperature in order to get condensation to begin. And this only happened over the course of an hour. So this is showing you the passage of a dry, of a front we call a dry line. And again, thunderstorm chasers love them.